Well, because of the um, excellent bit of uh, Q&A there, I probably have rather less time to do this than I initially imagined, but we'll try and get through as much as we can in uh, the, the time remaining. And um, I hope this will be as interactive as the uh, last 15 minutes has been. Um, <coughs> how this is set out is, uh, we call them mini case studies. Uh, so there's a slide with a few facts on, a few outline facts, and then, then a, a question. And I think we've got uh, 11 of these in this section, and we'll try and get through as many as we can. And the idea is I'll ask the questions, and then I hope that people in the audience will volunteer thoughts and answers. Um, first uh, case study deals with uh, looking at restrictions on the sale of assets and how, how does that affect fair value. And the particular example here is uh, an entity holds some shares for which there is a quoted price in an active market. Um, and this company enters into a loan. And as one of the terms of the loan, it pledges uh, this investment that it owns as collateral for the loan. And because it's pledged the uh, shares as collateral, it's not able to sell the shares uh, unless and until it repays the loan. So Mario mentioned that uh, restrictions on sale of assets uh, may be taken into account in some circumstances in terms of measuring the fair value of an asset. So in this case, do you think the fact that this entity <coughs> cannot sell these shares should impact how it measures fair value? Any, anyone with any views? Uh, a fair value of the investment in the securities that's on this company's balance sheet that it has pledged. Okay. Well, the key uh, issue here, and it goes back to the sort of idea of unit of account and what are you actually measuring and valuing things from a market participant perspective. So, um, these shares are the same shares, even though they've been pledged. Uh, the fact that this company has pledged the shares to um, the lender under this loan is not a feature of the shares themselves. It's just a feature of the loan agreement. And you only take account of a restriction on the ability to sell an asset if it's a characteristic of that asset if it's a feature that a market participant would take into account if it was acquiring that asset. And in this case, a particular entity can't sell its particular shares. And that's a feature of the entity, it's not a feature of the shares. If somebody was to, the third party was to acquire these shares, they would be unrestricted. And in terms of applying the standard uh, and looking at the effects of restrictions, you've got to really analyse the facts and circumstances and see, well, is, this, is any particular restriction a feature of the thing that you're valuing or just a feature of the entity that happens to hold the asset today? So you think about things like, well, would the restriction transfer to a third party that acquired the shares? Is the restriction part of the contractual terms of the instrument or is it something imposed by regulations? And you know, issues with regulations tend to get, you know, give rise to quite complicated issues. For example, you know, if... Uh, some shares are restricted by regulations as to whether they can be traded. Uh, well, that's obviously, that, that doesn't appear to be like a feature of the holder, but sometimes the regulations might only impact the particular holder or a particular type of holder, like sometimes affiliates or related parties are prevented from trading in shares, uh, but other unrelated parties of the issue would be free to trade. But in other cases, you might have just have restrictions on certain identified shares present, prevent them from being listed and so or traded in a particular market and that if that is a feature of the shares because those shares don't have that particular permission or regulatory permission to trade then it would be something you take account of in measuring fair value. Sorry, I have a question. So it should be termed in the Well, well, Yeah. If the terms of the security um, said that the, any holder could not sell them without some sort of commission, then that would clearly be a feature of the instrument. 
Now what can get a bit more difficult uh, and I think was uh, area quite some quite difficult judgments are things like underwriting agreements where if you have a contract, a side contract that says a particular holder can't sell then that doesn't seem like a term of the instrument <laughs> and you would ignore it because it's basically just a separate contractual arrangement. Um, so you've got to get into the detail and I think they're gonna, there are around underwriting agreements some grey areas as to exactly whether uh, restrictions are transferable or not. But what if the restriction is by paying a fine? Will we deduct it from the fair value? And would it mean that we are considering transaction costs in the fair value? I must admit, I have never, I've never come across a situation where uh, you could transfer it, but you would pay a fine. Um, now, it, if what that meant by transferring it, you were breaking the law, uh, then I don't think we would sort of, I guess, accept an approach to fair value measurement that uh, <laughs> Suppose you can involved in the legal act. But uh, I guess if it was, well, if it was a more normal sort of situation where it said you legally you were permitted to sell it, but you yeah, had to pay some form of tax or regulatory imposition, then that would sound more like a transaction cost. Oh, well, if it's a transaction cost, then it would be excluded. Yeah. Although they are formally owned by the uh, entity that gave the law. Well, I guess it depends what you mean by the term pledged. Um, pledge is normally uh, indicating that some form of security interest has been granted to the lender. So legally, A would remain the owner, but in terms of the particular legal mechanics as who physically has the share certificate, uh, and whose name is on various legal registers could vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. But when we talk about pledging something, we normally assume that the, the contractual rights of the cash flows remains with uh, A, or he is the legal or beneficial owner of the shares. Um, so, case study two day one uh, gains, or indeed day one uh, losses. Uh, fairly sort of common type of uh, practice issue in the uh, bank industry. Uh, and we have a bank that has entered into an interest rate swap with a corporate client. This is a bank that's trading in derivatives. Uh, the bank, as well as selling to corporate clients <coughs> in the retail market, can also access a wholesale market for uh, interest rate swaps. And um, if it were to uh, price the interest rate swap it entered into in the wholesale market, even though the transaction price with the corporate client was zero, it would uh, estimate the value of the swap in the wholesale market as an asset of 10 uh, at the date it enters into the trade. And um, I guess two questions, two main questions. What's the fair value of the swap uh, from the perspective of B? And should B recognise a day one gain? We've got two different scenarios to think about. Firstly, scenario one, all the inputs used in the valuation technique are observable. And if maybe we stick with that one for the moment. So, B enters into this trade, transaction price zero, uh, observable data suggests it has a value of plus 10. So, what would people think the fair value is? Uh, yeah, 10 is the right answer. <laughs> uh, but basically, although B's transacted in the retail market, it would identify the wholesale market as the principal market, and it has a robust valuation that gives a value of 10. So if it books, if it determines the fair value is 10, does it book a gain of 10? Yeah. Um, basically, um, uh, IFRS 13, as Mariela explained, sort of in some ways carried forward a presumption from uh, IS39 that uh, at fair value of initial recognition is generally presumed to be the transaction price. So there are some cases where that may not be the case, and one is where you transact for the item in something other than your principal or most advantageous market, um, uh, which suggests that you can get to a fair value of 10 here. 
Uh, what IFRS 13 uh, did not do is say in all cases what you do with the difference between the transaction price and the fair value of initial recognition. It says the default treatment is to book in P&L, but it says you should go and look at what the standard that permits or requires the fair value measurement says about the subject. And so in the case of financial instrument, we go to IS39, IFRS 9, and um, IFRS 13 largely, again, carried forward the existing rules in IS39 that you can only book a day one gain or loss uh, if you have a level one price or if your, value, your estimate of fair value is supported by a valuation technique that uses only observable market data. So in scenario one, that threshold is met. We book uh, a swap at a fair value of 10 and book a gain of 10. And if uh, all the inputs are not observable, what would you think the fair value of the swap would be? 10? Would you like to explain why you think it's 10? Uh, because it will be a level 3 fair value, but still fair value. Yeah, um, one of the changes, quite a subtle change um, from pre uh, IFRS 13 on our IS39 and how it, how it looks after uh, modification is IS39 basically said in cases where the initial fair value that's different from the transaction price is not wholly supported by observable market data then you assume the transaction price uh, equals fair value. So in this, in scenario two, pre IFRS 13, you would have said the fair value was zero. But IFRS 13 doesn't say that. It says, well, you work out the fair value and you come up with your estimate of fair value, which yeah, could, would in this case still be 10. But on to the next point, would bank B recognise a day one gain? No, because the uh, valuation is not supported wholly by observable market data, it can't put the gain. And what um, IS39 post IFRS 13 says is, well, rather than actually measuring this derivative at fair value, uh, you measure it at fair value plus or minus the deferred day one gain or loss. Um, let's uh, explain here. So, I guess we all think and people would still say, well, un under IS39, IFRS9, all derivatives are measured at fair value. But um, actually, it's a little bit more complicated than that post IFRS13. They're measured at fair value, but if there was any day one P&L, uh, then the carrying amount is actually adjusted by the amount of day one P&L. How you run that day one P&L off over time is basically unchanged by IFRS13. So basically, the uh, 10 deferred day one gain would be run off in accordance with factors that market participants would consider in pricing the uh, asset liability. Sorry, what would be the... It's, an, it, no, it's just an adjustment to the carrying amount. So in this case, the carrying amount, the net carrying amount of the derivative would be zero, uh, and that ca net carrying amount would be made up of fair value 10, deferred day one difference minus 10, net carrying amount zero. So basically, uh, I'm Sorry, uh, um, I would like to extend the previous question. Yep. On our financial statements, nothing uh, changes, or we, we have an asset and something in other comprehensive income, or we have nothing nowhere, because we, uh, the data is unobservable. What you, what you would have, in terms of the, the face of the statement of financial position, you would have in this case zero. Um, because the inputs are unobservable, <coughs> But that carrying amount of zero is made up of a plus 10 and a minus 10. And then when you went off into the notes, uh, basically you would find uh, disclosure around the minus 10 adjustment. And um, similar to what was there under IFRS 7 before, you would have an analysis of the movements in the basically amount of unrecognised day one profit. Uh, and the only real difference in the disclosure 
that IFRS 13 introduced is it, it asks you to explain why you think your estimate of fair value at this recognition is, is more reliable than the transaction price. Yes, but with uh, derivatives, always, uh, almost always the transaction price is zero or very little. So it means that if we have a derivative and the uh, market is not active and we don't have observable data, we will not show our derivatives in our um, financial statements because transaction prices for derivatives are uh, nil. Well, I, you know, I mean, one of the very difficult things about derivatives and why people say they're so toxic and high risk is the transaction price for a derivative often is zero or a very small amount but roll forward one week or two weeks and it can be a very big number because um, changes in market parameters can have a massive uh, impact that's really proportional to the notional amount of the derivative rather than the transaction price. So um, if you think about it, on day one you have fair value plus 10, deferred day one gain minus 10, but come day 30 you could have fair value plus a million and deferred day one difference at minus 10. You're not, you're not freezing the derivative value at zero going forward. <laughs> uh, what, the, the, sorry, what do we do about the notional amount of the uh, interest rate swap? Um, well, the, the notional amount of the interest rate swap is certainly not recognised in the statement of financial position or, 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 or P&L. Um, so really to what extent derivative notional amounts are disclosed is really an IFRS 7 issue and it I guess depends on how the entity thinks is the best way to disclose information about market risk. So some entities will do that by disclosing notional amounts because uh, they think that's helpful. Others may disclose risk information by you know, value at risk or other analysis, so may or may not show up in the financial statements. Uh, Chris, I have a So the, the, the notional amount and the fair value are totally different. Um, in, in the case of currency swap, where you have to swap the notional at the beginning, uh, yeah. in that case you would uh, recognize. Well, uh, okay, with a typical cross-currency swap, you know, what will happen is there's an exchange of principal amounts in the two currencies at the beginning, and then normally there's an exchange back of the principal amounts in the in the two currencies at the end. Um, but a, a derivative, the fair value of a derivative is, is measured on a net basis. You look at the derivative as a single financial instrument and how a cross-currency swap is normally priced is that the amounts of principal that are exchanged at the beginning are equal and opposite uh, measured at the spot rate on the day you do the deal. So the net exchange of cash, the net transaction price and generally the initial fair value is approximately zero. And in terms of accounting for going forward, because you're measuring the derivative on a net basis, as FX rates move, uh, you have a net fair value of the derivative that predominantly represents the changes uh, in the value of the two principal amounts. But what you have is the net difference between the value of the two. You don't have a gross asset and a gross liability. You, you measure it on a net basis. I'm so sorry. <laughs> but this no, no, go ahead. In this example, uh, in scenario two, we did not have transaction costs, right? No. But we had the fair value with unobservable data, which is 10. Yeah. So it requires us just to defer the gain. Uh, how do we defer? We debit the asset and credit deferred income, or? Well, uh, I guess go back. On your balance sheet, the net carrying amount would be this derivative would start at zero uh, and how that would be broken down. There are no particular rules about how to do the bookkeeping. <laughs> uh, would be a fair value of plus 10 and a deferred, deferred day one adjustment 
whatever you would like to call it, of minus 10. Why minus 10? It's just uh, in the liability 10 and well, debit you can, 10? Well, okay, you can say it's a fair value of debit 10 and a deferred day one difference of credit 10. I mean, Credit fair value? No, no, no. Credit the asset account. The, the, the net value of the asset is zero. So it's like an allowance against the carrying amount of the asset. So we, haven't, we have the asset still in our balance sheet. Yeah, you, you, you are a party to the swap, it's just it's fair value measurement, sorry, it's measurement, net measurement in the balance sheet is zero. Because you remeasure the fair value, you book gains and losses through PL because it's derivative um, based on the change in fair value, and then also you have this day one deferred difference of let's call it minus 10, uh, and you only get to release that difference to the extent there are changes in factors, including time, that market participants would consider in pricing the derivative. And of course, if we're talking about well, one day. Uh, uh, that's not much in terms of passage of time. So if this was a 10 year instrument, the amount you would release from the 10 is uh, immaterial. So you would basically have 12, uh, 12 fair value minus 10 deferred, give you a net two. Yeah. Uh, well, would it be okay to go on to the next <laughs> case study? <laughs> uh, question was, well, when is the day one difference released? And the answer is, well, it's released um, under IFRS 13 slash IS39 post IFRS 13 in the same way as it was released before IFRS 13 was published. So basically, uh, you look at changes in factors that market participants would consider. Now, that's quite subjective and it depends very much on the, you know, the product and what factors you think led to this day one difference. But often what we see is if this was a 10 year swap, somebody might say, well, in the absence of anything better, I'll amortise the 10 over 10 years. More sophisticated ways of doing it would be to say, well, okay, maybe maybe I've got unobservable differences because my swap curve only goes out six years. Uh, and the point is that, well, the the instrument pricing will become fully un fully observable, therefore, over the next four years. So I'll therefore, amortise it over four years. Others, you know, there may be even more sophisticated techniques than that. Uh, some people look to say, well, if I do a transaction, where I close out the risk. Uh, that relates to the unobservable pricing factors, that's when I recognise it. Uh, just final, maybe. Yeah. Uh, I have, uh, I, uh, we know that the fair value is 10. If we are sure that we consider all possible inputs, we have all the information, we make the debit asset credit income, for example. If it was fully observable, yes. as in if, if, one, if we are sure that we consider all possible inputs. Yeah. If not, we have to add uh, credit uh, debit losses yeah. because it may be some losses that we are not considered. Yeah? Um, well, it's possibility of uh, be able to meet some unobservable uh, facts is uh, brings us to the nearly the asset. Because we know just the part of information. Yeah, I mean it's a it's a reliability threshold. You know, it sort of gets tied up with. Uh, generally, you, you look at IFRS as a very prudent approach to revenue recognition, and I guess it's saying it doesn't feel right uh, to 
book a profit on day one based on some unobservable pricing inputs. And that's not really reliable enough to justify booking revenue immediately. If we have the same situation of another company, yeah. um, basically what you have just explained that IFRS in this case is playing more prudent regarding the revenue recognition, uh, then the other company will decide not to recognize or to say that my, my transaction price is the fair value zero. I will not defer, I will not recognize any day one differences, deferral and get involved into very complicated uh, pattern how to release it or never to release it. And then on day two, the second company will recognize 12 income. Am I right? No. Without First, all the well, complications. If we go back, the question was how does B measure this? And uh, we don't want to get into all the complexities of this. At the point, the reason that B says there's a fair value of 10, even though the transaction price is zero, is because B says, I access the wholesale market. And in the wholesale market, this instrument would have a price of 10. But if you were the corporate client, the corporate client does not have access to the um, wholesale market. So it would price the transaction uh, in its principal market, which would be this retail market. Now, that means it doesn't start off with this 10 difference. Exactly what the corporate client does do is, um, well, it has some complexities in it, but basically the, this 10 arises in this particular fat pattern because B has access to a different market, and that different market is its principal market, and how things are priced in the principal market is different from how this transaction is priced. Different story for the corporate counterparty. I should keep going until somebody stops me, I think. <laughs> Scenario three, also to do with day one gains or losses. Um, in this case, we've got a company that makes a loan to a related party. It's an interest free loan of 100 for three years. Um, the company says, well, I think that the, a market rate of interest on a loan like this would be uh, 5% a year, but that's not fully backed by observable market data. There's some unobservable factors in there like credit risk for, this, for the related party or liquidity risk, um, so it's not fully observable. Uh, I'll make it a bit easier to take the mathematics out of it. If you were to discount a three-year interest-free loan of 100 at a rate of 5%, you would get to a current uh, value of 86. So in this fact pattern, well what's the fair value of the loan and would, would the lender recognise a day one loss? Given that the 5% rate is not fully observable. or 100 or do you book a day one loss? Okay. Well, the lender is making the loan and it's advanced 100 and if it takes what it believes is a market rate of interest and discounts, it gets to a value of 86. It's given an interest free loan. And the answer is here that yes, even though the pricing to get to the 5% estimated market rate is not fully observable, the lender does book a loss on day one. And if we go back to this discussion on day one gains and losses and fair value of initial recognition usually equals transaction price, well, in order to say fair value equals transaction price, you've got to know what the transaction price is. And here there's a loan being made to a related party. It's clearly off market, it's clearly beneficial. And really, how you analyse the transaction is you say, well, I think. Uh, that 100 of cash that was advanced, 86 was a loan and 14 was a, like a gift to the related party and you just expense that 14. And it's not, you don't get into guides, you don't get into the discussion on observability 
effectively you estimate the fair value of the loan as 86 and say that's the transaction price for the loan. And that the other the receiving entity is uh, reflecting or not? The gain, they, they won gain for the... <laughs> well, the receiving entity uh, would book the loan at 86, you would expect. Now, whether it could book a day one gain is perhaps a bit more difficult because, uh, well, why did, it, why did this other party make the loan? Possibly it could, uh, if there was no shareholder relationship, it might be able to record a gain. If it was um, given on the direction of some common shareholder, some common controlling party, then it might recognise the 14 as an extra. If they don't recognise us again, what do they do with the 14? Well, th I think those would be the two choices. So either it's uh, a gain uh -huh. or it's equity. equity. So, I mean, if loans are between parent and subsidiary, they generally go to equity. I mean, the other possibility is if, it's, if there's some sort of government agency involved, then it could be an IS-20 issue. Principal and most advantageous market. Uh, i just sort of say, this uh, scenario doesn't include any transport costs. And the reason for that is because uh, transport costs are generally things that are, can be relevant for non-financial items because location is a relevant condition for a non-financial item. Uh, but for financial instruments, they're immaterial or sort of fully portable. So you don't generally have transport costs uh, coming into the calculation of fair value for financial instruments. Uh, so here this really looks at market prices and transaction costs. So there's two markets in this case for a particular asset. Price in market A is 99, but transaction cost to sell there would be 6. Uh, in market B, the price is 96, and the transaction cost to sell there would be 2. So in scenario 1, market A is the principal market, uh, as it's the market with the greatest volume of volume and level activity for the asset. So what would fair value be in scenario one? Yeah, 99, you just take the price in the principal market and you don't deduct the transaction costs. Uh, let's say we don't have reliable information on volume and level of activity in each of the two markets, or it's somewhat ambiguous. So what would fair value be in scenario two? 96? Got 96, 94? Yeah, the answer is 96, and it's a sort of two stage calculation. You've got to work out what's the most advantageous market, and you work out the most advantageous market by looking at this net amount, right? So, what's, the, what, what's most advantageous in terms of the net proceeds you would get from selling in the market? And that tells you that, well, it's market B, 94 versus 93. So, you do deduct transaction costs in that evaluation. But once you've made the evaluation that market B is the most advantageous market, you then use the price in market B without deducting the transaction costs. So you get to the rather strange result that actually the fair value in the most advantageous market is less than the market price in the least advantageous market. Well, I think. Well. The, reason, uh, the reasoning is basically, well, this is what the standard says. It says, identify a principal market. If you can identify a principal market, use the price in the principal market. If you can't, only if you can't identify a principal market do you look for the most advantageous market. Now, why did the board decide that? Because it's a vault fast from IS39. IS39 basically suggested using the most advantageous market, uh, and I think that's what the original exposure draft suggested. Um, <laughs> The reason it changed is, well, one, I think, to converge with US GAAP, because that's where US GAAP was. And I, th I think the sort of thing that, things that persuaded the FASB and ultimately the ISB was uh, the idea that, well, it's more reliable to use the price in the most active and most liquid market. So the, the sort of situations that the FASB discussed were like, if you look at equities in the US, you could maybe trade them on the New York Stock Exchange, the Philadelphia Stock Exchange, the Boston Stock Exchange, 
in most cases, trading volumes on the New York Stock Exchange dwarf other exchanges. So it would make more sense to use the New York price. <coughs> Yeah, well, uh, as, as Marilyn explained, the, <laughs> you, you would, yes, you would sell in market value, I guess, if, if these were all the facts you had. I mean, the, the standard has a lot of uh, colour around, well, in many cases, the principal market, the most advantageous market would be the same, and entities would be expected to transact in the principal market. In many cases, that makes sense. In other cases, I don't find it particularly compelling. And I think there are many entities whose business model uh, is, well, not to sell in the, mo the most liquid market. They make money by selling in markets that <laughs> are different from the principal market and they, they are basically taking a profit from arbitrage or distribution. Um, but the standard says use the principal market price uh, if you can identify a principal market. Case study five. Bid and ask prices. Uh, we've got two securities, X and Y. Uh, both have a mid market price of 100. For X, the spread is, uh, bid ask spread is 0.1 on either side. And for security Y, the uh, bid ask spread is 10 on either side of 100. So, do you think that NTL, which holds these two securities, could measure them using mid market prices? Yeah, for, for X, yeah, I think we can sort of get there. The standard says, as a principle, use the price within the bid ask spread that is most representative of fair value. It says using bid prices or offer prices is permitted, and it says that using mid market prices or other pricing conventions used by market participants uh, as a as a proxy um, for most representative price within the bid ask spread is, is okay. That's that's reasonable effectively. And if your spread is that tiny, well, 100 seems like a pretty good estimate of uh, what an exit price should actually be. Security Y. People be happy with using 100 there? No. Yeah, the spread on Security Y is much too big. I think to just say well. 100 would be a reasonable approximation of an exit price. Now, unfortunately, what the standard doesn't do is tell you well, what, what price to use for security Y. Um, my starting point, personally, would be, well, the idea is to estimate an exit price, i.e. a price you could sell at. Unless you have some special ability to deal with in the bid ask spread, I would suggest that your uh, best estimate of an exit price there is 90. Uh, and I haven't heard anybody try to use more creative arguments to get to uh, different answers uh, as yet. Case study six, premiums and discounts. So here we have a company holds uh, two types of equity investments. Um, these are unquoted equities and how the NC estimates their value to use some sort of valuation techniques that takes value, typical valuation multiples for comparable publicly quoted companies like uh, PE ratios or dividend yields uh, and applies those to its holding in these unquoted companies. Um, uh, if we look at the investment in Z, well M holds 5% of the shares of Z. When it's when it's looking to, when it's doing this valuation technique and saying, well, I'll start with uh, market multiples or market value indicators for quoted companies and apply them to this entity, should it make an adjustment to the fact that uh, the shares in Z are less liquid or not liquid? Yeah, the, the answer there would be yes. Um, generally, uh, for if an asset is liquid or marketable, that enhances its value. If you're valuing based on indicators or multiples from uh, 
uh, quoted liquid shares to value something that's not quoted and less liquid, it would be reasonable uh, to make an adjustment for that lack of liquidity. Moving on to W, um, M has 80% of the shares of W. Um, should the fair value of the investment in W be adjusted to include a control print? No. no? Yes? No. Why, why do some people say yes? Probably an unobservable factor that you could, <laughs> you could send it across. He, he thinks no. Why no? Well, I, I haven't heard people describe control premium as a, a transaction cost. And I think this is more a question of, well, what is the thing you're valuing? The unit of account um, question. And um, uh, we assume market participants can maximise, will transact to maximise value. So they could maximise value by selling an entire, the entire investment in W. Uh, that wouldn't be considered a transaction cost. But, but the question is really, what are we valuing? And when we look at the investment in W, that 80% holding, maybe it's made up of 80,000 um, shares, 80,000 individual shares out of 100,000 that W has issued. And the question is, well, what are we valuing? The whole block of 80,000 as one item, uh, or are we valuing 80,000 individual shares and valuing each one individually and then adding up all the values? Uh, uh, my view, I don't think it's my reality, is that in terms of valuing an investment in a subsidiary, measuring the fair value of investment in a subsidiary, that it's not really clear uh, what the unit of account is, and therefore, I guess you could read the standard either way. And this is something the board has been discussing, and it's likely that it will issue a proposed amendment that would clarify uh, that in terms of valuing an investment in a subsidiary, that you value the whole investment is one thing, but then it would add a rider and say, well, if you actually had a level one price for the individual shares that make up that investment, for example, if you've got a subsidiary with a free float, free public float, then you would have to apply uh, the level one price without any adjustment for control premium. So I guess that's sort of watch this space. Um, at the moment, I would say it's not clear until the board actually enacts some clarification. Case study seven. Uh, this is about a, a large holding, but in this case, it's not a controlling holding. It's not a holding that gives significant influence. The company has eight percent of the share capital of a public company. That eight percent is eight times the daily trading volume. Um, if you just valued that holding using the quoted market price, uh, then you would get to a value of 15 million. But if the entity were to sell that large stake in one transaction, uh, it would probably only get 13 and a half million, is what it estimates. So, what do you think the fair value is here? This sort of calculated 15 million number, or the 13 and a half million that it estimates it would actually get in exiting the position? Well, you know, it's a unit of account sort of question again, and it's related to transaction costs. Well, I guess the difference here, if it's an 8% holding, uh, it doesn't give significant influence or control, then it's going to be accounted for under IS39 or IFRS9. And um, for financial instruments within the scope of those standards, IFRS13 says, in the basis of conclusions, that the unit of account is generally the individual financial instrument. So here, you would have to value this as one and a half million individual shares. And the fair value of one share is 10, so the fair value of one and a half million of them is 15 million. And 
you can't include a discount for the fact that you would get less if you sold the whole block in one go. That would be an impermissible uh, blockage factor. And that's sort of different from the previous example, because in the previous example, there's uncertainty as to whether the unit of account is the whole uh, block of shares together. Ask about the supplementary question. So generally, unit of account for financial instruments under I-79 and I-9 is the individual instrument. But there is an exception that Mariela mentioned that in some cases, if you have uh, a portfolio of instruments that's managed together um, uh, in terms of offsetting market credit risks, then you can value the net market risk and or credit risk exposure from that portfolio on a, based on the net risk exposure. So here we've got a fairly simple example uh, where banks got 100 uh, assets and 95 liabilities, all have the same uh, market risk. So there's a fair degree of offsetting of market risk there. Uh, right, we'll make some simplifying assumptions. That one, these are level one instruments. And secondly, there is no discount or premium that results from the size of net risk exposure. Uh, the mid price for each uh, individual asset liability would be 100. Uh, the bid price is 99. Ask price is 101. And this bank's policy is to use bid prices for asset positions and ask prices for liability positions. So let's say the bank applied the portfolio measurement exception, then what would be the, fair the net fair value of the instruments in this portfolio? How would it approach the question? Well, it does the valuation on a net basis. So the quick way of getting to an answer, is actually a bit, bit more complicated, but with the simplifying assumptions, a quick way to get an answer, so well, it's got a net uh, long position of five. It, sorry, 500, that's close. It's got a net long position of five and it would value the net long position based on the bid price. So it would be 5 times 99, which is 495. So very close to 500. Well, it, it's, its policy, and this is the policy that I hope most banks will maintain going forward, is that they will use bid or offer. So you're allowed to use bid, or, bid prices for long positions and offer prices for short positions. There's a bit more conservative. It does reflect the business model rather better. So I would say net long position of five, value of that bid, that gets me to 495. Now what would be the answer be if it didn't apply the portfolio exception? The mental arithmetic is a bit complicated, but basically what would be the components of the valuation? How would it go about doing it? Well, if it doesn't apply the portfolio measurement exception, it, what it has to do is value all the instruments individually. So it says I've got 100 assets, so I value all of those at 99, and I've got 95 liabilities, and I value all those at 101. So when it applied the portfolio measurement exception, it got a value of 495. If it doesn't apply the portfolio measurement exception, that actually comes down to 305. So on a net basis, you know, it's, that's, that's like 40% lower. So this is a really big issue for banks. And of course what this, particularly on derivatives books, because how you trade derivatives, you don't buy a derivative and then sell it to somebody else. You build up big offsetting positions and you can have enormous portfolios with long and short positions. And this sort of question of bid offer spread on the accumulated portfolio could be many years worth of trading profits, essentially, you're talking. This is really quite a big issue in the banking world. Um, case study nine is about debit valuation adjustments. Now, one of the things that Mariella mentioned was IFRS 13 is very clear that in terms of valuing derivative liabilities, uh, you should have an adjustment for your own credit risk. Um, this uh, example deals with a bank valuing an interest rate swap. 
Um, and the slide, I guess there are two learning points in this uh, scenario. <coughs> Firstly, the interest rate swap that's being valued is an asset, not a liability. Today, this interest rate swap has a fair value of 100 before any own credit risk adjustment. Um, and secondly, the bank is saying, well, I don't think it makes sense to have a credit risk adjustment, partly because it's an asset, and secondly because uh, um, there's no intention of, as it were, realising um, this debit valuation adjustment or own credit risk adjustment by trading or transferring the swap to a third party, or just settling in the normal course of things. And really the learning point here is, well, even if you've got uh, something that today is classified as an asset, it can still have own credit risk because the feature of an interest rate swap or a cross-currency swap is as market prices change, what one day is an asset can tomorrow become a liability and what today is a liability can tomorrow become an asset. So those sort of forward type contracts can have, generally have both own credit risk and counterparty credit risk. And if you've got something that's an asset, uh, but a market participant would price it taking account of own credit risk because of that potential volatility in value, then you should be considering own credit risk in the valuation, even though it is an asset. Um, and the other learning point here is, well, the, yeah, as Mary they mentioned, people under IS39, some people argue, well, I'm not going to have an adjustment for own credit risk because I value things on a settlement basis, I wouldn't trade out of it. Well, that argument is just not valid, has, cannot be used under IFRS 9. So you always need an own credit risk adjustment if there is own credit risk in market participant. Um, so I realise I've run over quite a bit of because of the late start. I'll very quickly go through case study 10. This is to do with the guidance around significant decrease in volume or level of activity. And if we look at these particular graphs that explain what's going on here, there's a market where there was a lot of volatility during 2002. The market was shut for a while. Market prices have gone down. Trading volumes have gone down. Um, the valuation has been done at the end of 2002. Then what happens at the start of the next year is trading volumes pick back up and the market price goes up. And the issue... Uh, is well at the end of the year is there a quoted market price in the active market or do we say there's been a significant decline in the volume or level of activity therefore we get into all this complicated stuff around orderly transactions or not orderly transactions and maybe we don't, you don't treat this as just a straightforward level one price um, and really the learning point here is well when you look at the sort of second graph there are still 60 or 70,000 shares a day being traded in this company's stock and that might be significantly less than what was being traded before but that's still enough to give you an active market and if you've got an active market then really you're using the level one price you're not getting into all these other complexities and finally case study 11 does deal with something where you would have to get into those complexities and here we're talking about you know, holding in a debt security and there's been hardly any trading whatsoever uh, in the last few months. You really don't have an active market. Um, the last transaction that took price had a the last transaction that took place had a price of 60. The company that holds one of these securities and is trying to value it says, well, look, uh, this market is so inactive, so illiquid that no transaction price there represents fair value. Uh, the reason like there was that trade of 60 and there are low prices, it's all, it's all to do with market participants being irrational, it's all to do with wider problems with the economy, that's why there's no trading. And anyway, uh, I would never sell my security at, this, at a price of 60, I'll hold it to maturity. Um, so, how I'm gonna value it uh, is by using some sort of discounted cash flow model. Uh, I work out an estimate of what I as the holder think will be um, future cash flows on the instrument and I come up with what I think is a you know, reasonable rate of return for this sort of investment of 6%. I do the discounting and I come up with a value of 90 as opposed to this last market price of 60. Question is, well, is that is that an okay way to do things under IFRS 13? 
And the answer for various reasons is uh, no. Firstly, I think somebody mentioned in one of the questions they talked about a disorderly market. And I guess IFRS 13 doesn't talk about disorderly markets. There are markets that are active and there are markets that are not active. But when it comes to considering whether things are orderly or disorderly, it's about whether transactions, individual transactions are orderly or disorderly. And you can't just say, well, this market's illiquid, therefore all transactions are disorderly. Uh, you've got to look at the individual transactions and basically if there's evidence that a transaction is orderly, you take it into account in measuring fair value. Um, if you're not really sure whether it's orderly or not orderly, you still take it into account, but you give less weight to it than transactions that you definitely know are orderly. Uh, and it's only if you know or have evidence that a transaction is not orderly that basically you can then ignore the price of that transaction. Um, in terms of the technique that Kay used, well, uh, essentially it wasn't really looking at things like how a market participant would look at things. It wasn't trying to look at things that, in the way a market participant would. So it shouldn't be using its just own assumptions about cash flows and what are reasonable discount rates. It should look at what, a market, what it thinks a market participant would assume cash flows would be and what sort of risk premium and rate of return a market participant would demand. And similarly, the fact that K doesn't intend to sell the security at these current low prices is, is irrelevant to the valuation. That's a sort of entity specific intention of K. It's nothing to do with uh, the characteristics of, of the asset or how a market participant uh, would look at it. Now, if you have got an inactive market, then maybe you, know, you would have to go into looking at, you know, some, looking at what market prices you have got, which are a bit out of date. Uh, and then looking at data you get from markets for similar instruments and doing some sort of applying multiple techniques and weighting them. But you wouldn't just take the output from one of those techniques and say, well, that's the right answer. Maybe you can, you can, they could build a case for using a discounted cash flow model in addition to looking at the price of 60. But then in terms of weighting the outcome of the DCF technique and the last observed market price, you know, they'd have to be a bit more balanced in terms of trying to work out well, what is best evidence of fair value rather than just saying I'll plump for one. And as I mentioned that last transaction price is from 23rd of December. So you know when you are using that transaction price and input to fair value, you have to consider well has anything changed in the last you know in the eight days between that transaction and the year end to uh, suggest it should be adjusted in some way. I'm sorry if I'm to rush through those last few months at the end, but uh, thank you so much for all the various interesting questions that, and comments people put forward. And I, I don't think we've got time for any more questions. I'd be happy to <laughs> field anything anybody wants to throw at me. I, I think we should, we should uh, take a short break. Okay.